Okay, let's uh, start this morning with a word of prayer. Um, we always need the Holy Spirit's guidance when we're talking about things of this magnitude. Our dear Father in heaven, we consider it an honor that in Hebrews 4 we're told to <coughs> go to the head of the line and press right into your throne room whenever we need immediate consultation. This morning, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to be with us and enlighten our minds. Where two or three are gathered together, you say you are there. We take you up on that promise because we will need you to guide us in our thinking today. In thy name, amen. Okay, today we're talking, this is the, for those of you who may not know, this is the fifth in a series of 13 lectures. So uh, we will be looking at different aspects of um, the genetic code as related to, to the Bible. And today we're going to be talking about in the garden. Uh, review, which was uh, in lecture four, and I, every time that I, as I'm going through these different lectures, I try to give a small review of something that was highlighted in the last lecture that we're going to use in this lecture to kind of bring people um, up to speed. G-coupled proteins are a very important aspect of the communication within the, well, all, uh, all mammals, but specifically in humans is extremely important. And they are <coughs> a system I'm not going to take a lot of time with, but as you can see, that uh, it's, it's really a uh, protein that folds on itself and goes back and forth through the membrane three and a half times. It has seven folds to it. And uh, when any type of, um, and we're going to talk about those just briefly here in a second, if, if a, uh, uh, any, a biological chemical comes in and fits in like a lock and a key to that outer green kind of fluffy area up there, uh, it will um, change the conformation of the protein so that it will expose on the inside of the cell and uh, it will change the conformation to reveal an active site. And it will catalyze the, um, well, it can be a kinase. It, it can do, it, there's, it, it can do almost uh, multiple different chemical reactions to other uh, enzymes that are sitting in the inside the cell and in the process activate them. So this is what G-coupled proteins are. Um, G-coupled protein receptors are found only in eukaryotes, eukaryotes including yeast and animals. The ligands that, ligands that bind and activate these receptors include light sensitive compounds. In fact, that's how they discovered it. The light sensitive compound rhodopsin is a G-coupled protein. So it helps us uh, without that uh, dealing with uh, photons and everything we probably wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to see. Um, odors, feromes, hormones, and neurotransmitters. All the neurotransmitters are G-coupled proteins. And that's going to be very important here as we go forward. And vary in size from small molecules to peptides to large proteins. G-protein coupled receptors are involved in many diseases and are the, also the target of approximately 40% of all modern medicinal drugs. The G-coupled protein system in our body, they've discovered 1,400 so far and there's more. But for dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, epinephrine, gamma amino butyric acid, the list goes on and on and on. All of these work on a G-coupled protein. Now, this is an important paper, and I'm putting this up there for those of you who want to look into this further. G-coupled proteins uh, have been, well, let me back up. It's, there's a debate right now to, as to whether G-coupled proteins are the result of pseudogenes. Remember, we talked about those last week. Those are genes which have been brought in horizontally by mobile genetic elements or they have been protein coding areas in the body which mobile genetic elements have so, um, I'm going to use a regular term here, sabotage that they've taken them over. So they don't know whether G-coupled protein is something that was purely a, uh, the etiology was purely mobile genetic elements or if mobile genetic elements have been wildly successful in taking over the system and reshaping it into the way uh, that they are dictating. 
And this is a great article. It goes over through a number of areas. And of course, it looks at rhodopsin, which was one of the first G-coupled proteins that was discovered. If you own the G-coupled protein panorama of different receptors, there's, I can't think of anything you can't do in the body. You really have hit jackpot. You've really hit the jackpot if you can get this system and control it. And nobody argues that mobile genetic elements are in control of them. No one that does the research that has published the papers. They are, from all intents and purposes, and when you look at it, you would guess that they are, it seemed to be entirely under the control of them. That is, they have, they have taken over the system to that degree. <coughs> now, up until this lecture, we've gone over, we've learned about information theory, we've learned how that works with our genome, and we've applied that. And then we have looked at the genome itself, and we have found that there is it's absolutely riddled up to probably about 85% of our genome was added, and it was added in the form of mobile genetic elements. And uh, last week, we talked about that ad infinitum. Well, now today, we're going to say, okay, how did those mobile genetic elements get into our genome? What is a possible way? And science has nothing to answer on that. They, Right now, nobody knows. We talked about this last week, the hallmark genes that are required to get this, uh, the endonucleases, the integrases, and the reverse transcriptases that you have to have to, to have a takeover by the mobile genetic elements. Though there is no correlate in the rest of um, living organisms. There's no correlate to those enzymes. They stand alone. There's nothing they could have evolved from. They're de novo. They're new. And so there, science has no explanation as to where mobile genetic elements have come from, nor um, how they appear to be, at least, so well engineered to do what they've done. So now let's look at the garden story, because I would, my hypothesis is I think the Bible can shed a lot of light on this subject. And I'm going to present to you for the rest of the time this morning why I think so. What was the actual temptation? A lot of people think, well, Eve in the story, if you recall, she's wandering around by herself. She chances upon the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And as she's doing that, as luck would have it, a serpent flies into the tree, starts eating the fruit, and starts talking to her. And it's clear from this, at least inferred from the story, that serpents don't weren't talking prior to this, and so it caught her attention. And as the story is normally told, the, the, the serpent tempted her because she was hungry. He tempted her to eat some fruit. Well, I think that's uh, a, an indefensible position because if she's wander, walking around in the Garden of Eden, and let's just for argument say, say there's 500 trees of of different types of fruit and, and grapes and all kinds of nuts and wonderful things to eat. There's no way you're going to persuade me that she's gone without food for 24 hours and is famishing and has a low uh, glucose level in her bloodstream and is now at desperation corner and needs something to eat. And the, and the serpent says, here, I've got some food for you to eat. And she goes, no, God says we're not supposed to eat that, but oh, I'm so hungry. It had nothing to do with her being hungry. Something else is at stake here. There's no way she's walking around with all of this food at the ready and right next door is a tree of life. If she's really that hungry, go over there and have a, a pear. Get your blood glucose up again and then come back and talk to the serpent. So, this does not have to do with her being hungry and the, and the idea that we always told, well, we have to curb appetite. Well, it depends how you determine appetite because you see all food that you eat, you're really ingesting information. So I'm going to say that I'm okay with appetite when appetite really discusses about taking 
uh, genetic information in horizontally through the GI tract, then I have no problem with it. But the old concept that she's famishing, uh, much like Esau when he uh, made the deal for the lentils with Jacob, is just not, is not the case here. And what was the adversary trying to achieve? Was he just trying to get uh, Adam and Eve, uh, you know, God made some rules, might be a little arbitrary in some of the rules, and Adam and Eve, his idea was just to get them to step over the line, and that's all he had to do? What was his goal? What was he after? And that's what we're going to look at. Okay, the story. When I was growing up, I understood the story, well, I'm going to paraphrase the story, I'm going to modernize the story and kind of give you an idea of what I heard when I heard the story. Let's suppose that you, there's a husband and a wife and they have three children, six, nine, and twelve. And one day the husband calls the family in and he says, now listen, I'm the, I'm the head of this household. I make the rules of this household. My job is to protect the household. And I need everybody to understand that I'm the guy that makes the rules. And I make the rules in order to make all of you safe and to show that I love you. But I've got to determine whether you understand that and whether you're with me on that. And so the only way I can do that is I'm going to put out here on the kitchen table two bowls of fruit. Now, I've clearly labeled the, this bowl of fruit, fruit on my right. It's okay to eat. In fact, you should have fruit every day, so I want you to eat it. And in this bowl of fruit right over here that's right next to it, you're not to touch it. Now, the fruit looks the same. But this is the way I'm going to determine whether or not you are a good member of the family, a trusted member of the family. Now, let me tell you something else. The consequences if you eat of the fruit here on my left in this bowl are severe. You don't want to do that. In fact, you can lose your life. Now, children, do you understand what I just told you? Have I been very clear? Yes, Daddy, yes, Daddy, we understand completely. Everyone understands under no conditions are you to eat the fruit here on the left bowl on my left, but you can. In fact, you're encouraged to eat the fruit on the right. Yes, Daddy, we got it. Two or three weeks go by, and one day the six-year-old runs into the house. She's hungry, and she looks in the bowl of fruit that's acceptable, and there aren't any apples there, but she sees there is an apple over here in the bowl, which they're told they can't eat from, and she just goes, well, Dad can't really mean that, what he says. I really want an apple. Fruit looks the same. I bet it's, I'm just going to take it. And I'll, I'll, he's a good guy. He's a loving guy. He won't be any problem. She takes the fruit and leaves, eats it. That night, the father calls the family in. He goes, I counted the fruit here in the left uh, bowl, and some fruit is missing. Who ate it? Silence. And finally, the six-year-old goes, Daddy, I admit I ate it. And he goes, did you forget what I told you about the fruit? Oh, no, Daddy, I know you told us we weren't supposed to eat it. Bad things would happen to eat it. You clearly understood that you were eating the fruit from the wrong bowl. Yes, Daddy, I completely understand it. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. And he takes out a revolver, and he shoots the little girl in the head. Now do you think the rest of the family is going to go, oh, Daddy, we really love you now. We see that you have our best interests at heart. And yes, we now know that these rules are for our good. That you, our love for you knows no bounds. We aren't going to, none of us will want to transgress ever again. We think you're great. Now, if you were a next door neighbor and he walked over and says, I'd be willing to babysit your children or your grandchildren, would you let him? And God's got a problem with this story. Big one. If we wouldn't let him babysit our children, then all the other statements he makes about being loving really are nothing but empty claims. So we've got to, we've got to get to the bottom of what's going on here. Because if that story's true, 
we might as well disband this Sabbath school and I know I got better things to do. So let's go back and read the story carefully. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Well, it really repeats the word die twice, meaning dying you will die. And notice that he says, Thou shalt not eat of it. So he doesn't say thou shalt not touch it, thou shalt not think about eating it. He says the day you eat it. Okay, it's very clear. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened, and you will be as gods, knowing good from evil. He goes, oh, no, 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 that's not true at all. You really believe that? He says, I've got to tell you something. It's completely different. You eat of that tree, and you'll go to a new level of functioning. One of them's lying. Because those two... Those two claims are diametrically opposed to each other. They're 180 degrees apart. Okay, what was the adversary trying to get Eve to do in the story? Remember? He flew up into the tree, started munching on the fruit. What was he after? Now these are going to be my paraphrases that I'm bringing in because we've got so much to do today I couldn't just put each one of the biblical texts up and then go back and forth. We're going to have to kind of motor through, and I know with that comes generalizations, but bear with me. He wanted to re her to rely on her own sensory input as the ultimate reality instead of God's word. And, of course, we still have that situation going today, don't we? It hasn't changed. So he wanted her to say, look, don't just take what that guy claims. You have eyes and ears and a good brain. You can figure out for yourself what is really factual and what isn't. To doubt God had her best interest in mind when he forbade eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and he applied it in the following questions, and he did it very, very, very ingeniously, in my opinion. He starts out by saying, did God uh, really say you couldn't eat any of the trees in the garden? And with that, he's inferring, you know, God's the creator of all the trees here. I'm not going to argue that, which I think that's interesting. The devil didn't come in and argue whether God was a creator or, God or not. He gives that away in this discussion. He doesn't even go there. But he takes a completely different tact. He goes, um, you know, God created everything in this garden, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, Eve, Eve's agreeing. And then he goes, has God, um, has God ever treated you and Adam poorly? Has he ever been rude to you? Has he ever stood you up for an appointment? Has he ever been in any way physically uh, injurious to you? No. Everything has been really pretty good, wouldn't you say? Yeah. He's, he's actually been very gracious. Yeah, he agrees. Has any of the fruit that you've eaten, and you've been here for X amount of time, has it ever caused you any problems? even any indigestion or anything else, or has it always been positive? And Eve goes, well, starts to think, yeah, it's always been positive. That's inferred in, you know, is it true you can't eat, eat, eat of any of the trees of the garden, the fruit of the garden? Is it logical then that a life-giving God would create a tree whose fruit had the power to cause your death and put it in the garden right next to the tree of life where you can't miss it? Given the fact that everything in God's creation has been for your benefit, would it not be logical to assume that the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil would also be beneficial, not harmful if eaten? Do you have any evidence anywhere that, that anything that you've touched or been in this garden has been in the slight, slightest bit deleterious? The answer, no. Well, that's the fruit of this tree is also good. Why would God, a good, gracious God, make some, a, a tree that brings death? And you may be wondering, well, I'd like to see some proof of that. And I'm providing that to you as we speak. I've already partaken of the fruit. And as can readily be seen, 
Not only have I no untoward effects, but I've actually entered a higher rate of existence. I didn't, wasn't able to talk before I was flying around. I was just one of the snakes. Maybe he was one of her pet snakes. I don't know. And now that I've eaten of the fruit, do you see any problems with me? Am I dead? Oh no, I'm not dead, I'm talking. And I wasn't talking before I flew in the tree. The only difference is I've eaten of the fruit. That's the only difference. I've done the experiment for you. Here is clear, uncontrovertible evidence that what God said simply isn't true and you're seeing it in front of you right now in real time. Since we're both created beings, if the fruit has given me greater intelligence, greater ability to verbally communicate, etc., what wonderful things might it do for you? Look, I couldn't talk and I flew in the tree and I ate some of the fruit, now I can talk. You can already talk. I'll bet if you ate the fruit, why? You'd become like God. That's what he was selling. He wasn't selling her to try a new piece of fruit. Oh, come on, this is a great new piece here. It's going to taste really great. Or, boy, I know you're hungry. Here's something for you right now. He was selling her a new information system, and she knew it. Because how could a snake go and start talking to you unless it had the circuitry in the brain, which could only be engineered with the information system in the genome, as well as connections to vocal cords, which the snake, we have no evidence. They don't have them now, but we, uh, you know, there was no evidence, and the Bible makes it, suggests that they were not talking. So there would have had to been vocal cords arrive on the scene, and you can't just have those happen. They've got to be, they've got to come from a blueprint somewhere, which would have been a genetic blueprint. What the snake was saying is, I have changed. I have new information, new information system, and that's what I'm selling you in this fruit. And we don't know where you're going to end up, but you're starting up further than I was, and that means you have that much further higher to go. Eve knew what she was doing. This wasn't some prank. She was buying into the fact that she wanted a new information system, or at least in addition to the one she had an upgrade. What did the devil left out of this story? Conveniently. Himself. That's the unknown that he left out, which would have cleared up a lot of what, it, which would have changed entirely the whole scenario had Eve known that. So there is where the deception was. So Eve was talking information system, the devil was talking information system, and so we're going to talk information system. What was his goal? Disbelief? Yeah, he wanted her to disbelieve God, and he provided what appeared to be an absolutely airtight experiment where he served as his own control. Believe a lie? Well, this was a lie. Yeah, he wanted her to believe that the fruit carried a lot of uh, great information, which I'm going to suggest to you it did not. He wanted her to disobey? Yes, he wanted her to disobey, but was that his end point? No, he wanted all three of them, but he wanted those to, prov to provide stair steps to get her to where he really wanted her to go. Now, if we look at the question, well, oh, it, this just had to do with deception. That's all. It just had to do with deception. All he was trying to do is get them to believe a lie, and, and, and in the process of doing that, the mental circuitry of their brains would somehow melt down, and that would translate into genetic changes, and, and all of those, of course, we can't find any correlate in today's world that would support anything like that. 
the key is, is Adam wasn't deceived. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. This is the American King James. If you go to the Good News Bible, it puts it this way. And it was not Adam who was deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and broke God's, God's law. Adam knew what was happening. He was not deceived. He didn't disbelieve God. He did. He, he believed that what God said was true. He thought that death was coming. And I'd suggest to you the reason he did eat, ate the fruit was not because he bought the story Eve told him about the serpent. It was because he knew Eve was going to die and he figured, I'm going to die with her. I can't, I can't fathom living here any, without her. That's why he took it. Romeo and Juliet story, sort of. Maybe Shakespeare got the idea from there, I don't know. In order to be deceived, one must first disbelieve God and then believe a lie, and Adam did neither. He knew what he was doing when he ate the fruit. And he still got the consequences. What was the deceiver's goal? For God does know that in the day, notice, you eat. <coughs> Not think about eating, not think about touching the fruit. The day you eat it thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's what the devil said. The day you eat it. So he wants her to eat it. God told her not to eat it. And Eve, what does Eve think? And when, the, and the, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. There you go. That was her motivation. She first looked at the fruit. Did it look bad? No. Did it smell good? Yes. So it wasn't spoiled. Why does she want to eat it? She wants to get whatever is inside that fruit because it's, whatever it is, she feels it's going to make her wise. She took the fruit thereof and did eat. So everyone agrees that eating is crucial for this transaction to take place. God does, the devil does, and Eve does. All of them and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. All three players in this drama completely agree that eating of the fruit is key to what comes next. The Hebrew word there for wise it was to give insight, to teach, or to give comprehension. The only way that this could happen instantaneously, if it could happen at all, would be through a change in the information system of Eve, because apparently the snake who had already eaten of the fruit, had developed vocal cords in the CNS circuitry to control them, and this could only happen via an addition to his information system. The temptation's final purpose then was not just to deceive her about God's character, but it was to get Eve to agree to change her information system. For that is what apparently had happened to the snake. Does sin have a physical basis, or is it just a state of mind? Well, in order to define something like this, you have to look, what are the parameters that affect it? How is it transferred? Well, through heredity, mobile genetic elements in the genome. That's physical. Why, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed on all men, for that all have sinned. Paul makes it very clear this is genetically transferred, physical. What are its consequences? Well, the first death, we talked about that in lecture three, are clearly, unmistakably, 100%, everyone that looks at it agrees, are, are the result of mobile genetic elements. And the second death, which will be discussed in lecture 13, I'll give you a little hint. They're the cause there, too. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Another way of reading the Greek is sin pays its wage death. Sin pays it. God doesn't pay it. Sin pays it. Is there something that can reverse this death? Yes eating of the tree of life. 
And the Lord said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So, I'm going to argue that sin is a physical problem. It's transmitted physically. The consequences it brings on are physical. And if you are going to give an antidote to get out of the system, it also is physical. And you define this concept by the parameters that influence it, that can correct it. So if, 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 if a physical thing can correct the problem, then you're dealing with a physical issue. <coughs> How could mobile genetic elements get into Adam and Eve's genome in the first place? Well, if you're awake, I think you know where I'm going. God and the devil, we have two choices. God and the devil made an agreement that should the pair eat of the forbidden fruit, God would remove them from the garden, allowing the devil to carry out his purposes. Okay, that's an option. I wasn't there, you weren't there. And our history as, reading, writ, as written in the Bible doesn't comment on this. It doesn't say if there was something actually in the fruit or if this was all just an agreement that could have been made between God and the We have no comment. So we don't know. Our other option is there were mobile genetic elements in the fruit. We have two trees here, one each in the middle of the garden. If you read in Genesis 2 where it talks about God creating them and putting them there, there were special trees. They were different from all of the other trees. Now, even today, and I'm, I'm going to at the uh, risk of repeating myself, even today, every, when you're eating fruit, you are mainly eating information, genetic information, which goes in and interacts with your genome. When you eat grapes, you get resveratrol. Resveratrol goes in and stimulates sirtuin-1, which is a protein coding area in the gene, which pr produces uh, different uh, proteins, which actually go stop something called mechanistic target of rapamycin, which is our aging big enzyme that causes us to age. See, that's how it works. Purely physical. Genetic, chemical, biochemistry par excellence. So, what does God say about the tree of life? Well, he says, according to Genesis 3.22, which I just read to you, so I didn't put it back here again, eating of it makes you last, live forever. Even if you've done something you shouldn't have done, even if you've ingested fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Also, it says in Revelation 12, 22, 12, and the leaves of the tree for, were for the healing of the nations, including biological active ingredients in the leaves. So it's not just in the fruit. And as I said today, uh, fruit is primarily important information that your body needs. Well, that, 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 that the, the fruit brings in the information that you ingest, does very... Um, wonderful things to your body, to your enzymatic functions, and to your genome. You're eating information. The fructose is to make it sweet so you'll eat it. And that goes for all of our food, by the way. And that's why processed food is so bad, because all the information is processed out, and all you're left with is the energy part, which is what was to tempt you to eat the good stuff in the first place. Well, why couldn't there be something in the tree of knowledge of good and evil and its fruit? We've clearly established there are very active biological product, uh, chem, um, molecules, not only in the fruit of the tree of life, but also in its leaves. And God said, don't eat of it. And the devil says, you need to eat of it. And Eve says, in order for me to get what I want, I've got to eat of it. To me, it just seems logical that there could be something in that fruit. All right, but let's suppose there was some mobile genetic elements in the fruit. Could they have gotten in from the fruit, gone through the stomach, which has a low pH, somewhere around 2.5 or less when you're ready to eat a meal, and uh, get through that acid bath and then go through all of the different enzymes that are dumped in from the common bile duct from the pancreas and survive? 
When I was growing up, I thought when I ate food, by the time I chewed it and it went through my stomach, it was broken down to the atoms. And then the body picked up the atoms and then reassembled them and put them together. I couldn't have been more wrong. It's exactly the opposite of that. It says here, um, well, this is a, a, an experiment which was done by two, four people are on the, um, on the, uh, as authors, but two of the authors actually did this experiment on themselves because they went to an ethics committee to try to get permission to do this experiment on a larger group of people and they were turned down because they said it was unethical. So the authors said, well, then we'll do it on ourselves and we won't be subject to this and so two of them did it. And what they did was they took some rabbit meat, well, let me read this to you, it says, um, Few attempts have been made to study the transfer of DNA from ingested food across the intestinal barrier. A low uptake of ingested DNA has been observed in mice, cattle, and poultry. There have been no reports on humans so far. Maintenance of species barriers, now listen, protection against retrotransposons, those are mobile genetic elements. Anytime, those of you who were here last week, that should be sending off alarm bells optimization of oral DNA vaccines and the fate of genetically modified foodstuffs are issues where the topic is of importance. We therefore use the high copy number rabbit retrotransposon RERV-H and the rabbit mitochondrial DNA to study the transfer of DNA from ingested rabbit meat into the bloodstream of two human volunteers. So they labeled the rat, I mean the uh, rabbit, these are retro elements now. These are retro elements. Exactly what I'm talking about when I say mobile genetic elements. They were, they, the mobile genetic elements in the rabbit they labeled. And they're specifically looking for those in the bloodstream of the volunteers. One hour after a meal of rabbit meat containing 10 to the 14 copies of the RERV H, that's the mobile genetic element. DNA, a maximum concentration of 200 copies of this mobile genetic element per milliliter of peripheral blood was observed, which corresponds to the uptake of approximately 10 to the sixth of those mobile genetic elements. Uh, the, the, they were noted at one hour and they were detected, and this is the important part, they were detected not only in the bloodstream, but they were also detected in cellular and in the cells and the plasma. So in other words, they ate some mobile genetic elements that were, had been labeled in rabbits, in the rabbit meat, and then they took their own blood and they found that it had, some of it had gotten through, a fair amount had gotten through, and not only had it gotten through into their bloodstream, but it had passed into the extracellular fluid and into the cells themselves. Okay, why is that so important? Well, they go on to say, the relative ease with which mammalian cells and culture can take up in and integrate and express exogenous non-self DNA by transfection shows that cellular defenses against foreign DNA have, been, have their limitations. They're referring to a paper here, a couple of papers, and what happens is what the cells do is if there's free-floating DNA, you would think that the cell would go, oh no, that could be a problem. We're going to leave that. We know there are viruses around, but no, the cell takes it in and it finds it when it gets into the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm says it doesn't belong here. Put it into the nucleus, and they puts it and it puts it into the nucleus. So then the question is, well, what happens at this point? Because this now becomes very crucial for our discussion. We down, now know that you can definitely have mobile genetic elements in that fruit, and it will end up inside of a cell's nucleus. We've, we've covered it, that ground. There's no question about this. It's a fact, Jack. It gets through. And it gets through unchanged. How do I know that? We'll go to the next study. What they did in this study is they took some mice. And what they did is they took a protein for the green fluorescent protein. You know, if you've ever seen fireflies, I live in Ohio, and that's, the, that's one of the, the green fluorescent protein is what lets them light up at night. But there is, uh, the one that they're going to use here is the one that has to have a black light put on it and then it glows. Uh, if any of you have taken a biology course, you, you've been, uh, I'm sure you've seen that. 
And what they did was they took this green fluorescent pr protein coding area, or gene, and they put it in rat kibble, but they also included two other things. They, uh, I think it was a T4 macrophage and, uh, and an ad adenovirus uh, type 2. And the reason they included both of those is because those guys have enzymes. They have the integrase and they have the um, endonuclease, which are needed to get this, this gene. If it can make it all the way into the cell, it's got to somehow be put into the DNA so it can be transcribed. And in order for it to be put into the DNA and be transcribed, there are no enzymes in the cell to do that. You have to supply the enzymes which come with mobile genetic elements because they're the only ones that, have a, that do that. The body doesn't do this. So the mobile genetic elements come with these enzymes that go onto the DNA, clip, cut a, cut a hole in it, take the new gene, put it in, and then sew it back up again. That's the integrase and the endonuclease. So they had to include those two enzymes with the mix. And they put it in the kibble too. And they just let the, the mice eat it. And what they found was um, they checked at 12 and at 18 hours. And what they were going to look at is they're going to look at two, they're going to sacrifice the mice, and they're going to look at the, in, the sequel epithelium, and they're going to see if they can find any evidence of this green fluorescent protein having been transcribed. So that means it has to get all the way into the cell, and it has to get into the nucleus, and it has to be put into the DNA, and not only put into the DNA, successfully transcribed. And that's what they found. See all those little green marks? See those arrows? The whole gene got through unscathed, was put into the DNA in the, mouth, in the mouse's cecum epithelial cells, and was transcribed. If there were mobile genetic elements in the fruit, they definitely could have gotten through, and they definitely could have become part of, of Adam and Eve's DNA. So we've solved that question. Interesting evidence which supports that MGs were fruit born and not introduced later outside the garden can be found in what transpired soon after the pear ate the fruit. And the eyes of them were both opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, the people <coughs> who say, well, this the eating of the fruit was purely just breaking one of God's rules and when God comes, he's going to administer justice. Well, that's not what happened. Something happened right away and if people say, yes, but that's because they broke the rules, well, then it has to be something physical because if it's God who has to, to bring the judgment, we all know that when we, we punish our children, if those of you have had it, when is it most efficacious? Is it efficacious to punish them before you even know they've done something wrong and you happen to know it and they don't and you cause something out of the blue to happen to them and they don't know where it's coming from? Is that going to get you where you want to get with that correctional activity? Or do you come and sit down and explain it to them and then you provide whatever correctional remedial um, activity that you wish to do. Which is more efficacious? I think we all know that the latter is. And certainly God is as good a parent as we are, or better, one would hope. So something happened to them. We did, they said that they're naked. We aren't told in the Bible exactly why they felt they were naked, but they noticed the difference because they started sowing leaves. So it must have been something marked. It hadn't, couldn't have been something minor, and it was a physical problem. Even if it was that all of a sudden their eyes actually changed, and Adam says, Eve, I hadn't seen you before, and, which is a little ludicrous, but it still is physical. No matter how you're going to try to cut it and dice it and slice it, this is a physical problem, and it happened before God has addressed them. And if, it ha if they ate the fruit in the morning, we know that it can be expressed in their DNA within a matter of hours. I just showed it to you. In 
And the man said, now God does come. And he says, where are you guys? And, and, and he says, I can't find you. And Adam says, well, we're hiding. And God says, why are you hiding? And he said, well, we're naked. And God said, did you eat of the fruit I told you not to eat of? Now, hours earlier, when Eve brought Adam the, 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 the fruit, Adam was willing to eat the fruit rather than be without the love of his life. And it's understandable. But now what does he say when he's confronted? And the man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the treat, and I ate it. The first thing he does is he throws her under the bus. If you hadn't made the woman, this is what he's really saying, if you hadn't have made the woman and put the woman in this garden, I wouldn't have eaten of the tree. I knew not to. I wasn't deceived, and I wouldn't have done it. It's her fault. No, it's your fault. You shouldn't have made the woman. And then you know what the woman said. She goes, well, no, it's not my fault. You made the snake, and the snake beguiled me, and he made me eat the fruit. I wouldn't have done it if there had been no snake. I would not have touched that fruit. You shouldn't have made the snake. It's your problem. So what does God do at this point? God says, okay, it is my problem. I did make all of these things. So now let's tell you what's going to happen because of what you've done. Now, when I grew up and as I read about the curses, this is what I, and when I read them over, I thought, ooh, boy, they are going to really get it now. And when I read the next couple of verses, boy, was I right. God's going to say some things to the snake. You're going to have to, on the, you're going to eat dust. You're going you're to grow on up around on your belly and some bad things are going to happen to you. Uh, we're going to put enmity between you and the woman and then he says, which we're going to go over in a minute, and then he says to the woman, you know, every time you have a baby, you're going to wish you never had eaten that fruit. I'm telling you, you are really going to wish you hadn't have done it. Boy, do I have something special for you. And Adam, you're not going to get away with it. You shouldn't have messed with me. You messed with the wrong guy. Guess what I have for you, Adam? It's a daily thing. Eve, it's when she has her babies. But I'm telling you, you're, every day you are going to sweat. And you know what? It's going to be hard to get enough food. And I'm going to tell you, some of your progeny are not going to get enough food. They're going to work hard, and the ground's not going to provide it, and they're going to starve. And boy, are they going to wish you hadn't eaten the apple then. Sounds sort of like the parent that pulls out the revolver and shoots the child, doesn't it? You'd expect that from that parent, wouldn't you? Let's look this over. I was talking to Paul. I'm not very good at pronouncing Hebrew, and I don't try to be. Uh, but the word for uh, in, the, in the Genesis 3 where he talks about cursing, and I'm going to try as a harar. Is that close enough? Uh, arar. Arar. <laughs> Please forgive me. I, I shouldn't have even ventured into this venue. I'm sorry. It means to bind with a spell, hem in with obstacles, render powerless to resist. I'm going to say now, let's go back and let's put this definition to what God said. Instead of having him come in with a heavy-handed mallet and say, bend over, or a strap, it's time for the woodshed for all three of you. I'm going to start with a the snake, then you, you're next, and Adam, you're last. Let's take a little look and see what the Hebrew really says. And God says to them, now I'm going to tell you about some things you are going to be powerless to resist. You are going to be hemmed in with some obstacles that you cannot overcome. And they will bind you. You made a choice. You went for a new information system. And these are big changes and I need to tell you about them because you'll be blown away. And we are told in the New Jerusalem there will be no pain there. So the discussion with Eve, what he's taking is the, what most of us, I think, would agree is, well, there's an argument whether it's a, a kidney stone or a, or, or a birth, which is more painful, but I, I'll go with God on this one. I'll defer to him. Uh, he picked the most painful incident that's going to happen to humanity, and he, and he uses that as an example of what is going to be new. You guys are going to experience pain, which is a G-couple protein, by the way. Don't forget that. Um, 
he says, you're going you're to experience pain. And to Adam, he says, something's going to happen to the ground. You aren't going to be able to eat. And then, he, and, it, and then he also says something to the snake. Now what we're going to do for the rest of the time is we're going to go look at this. We're going to drill down and we're going to see from an information system point of view what could have been going on here or what appears was going on here. God starts with a serpent. Remember, we went like this. Adam says, no, it's the woman. The woman said, no, it's a serpent. So now the serpent's there, and the serpent's strangely silent now, not talking. Chattering away earlier, it doesn't say a word now. So God says, okay, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to start with a serpent. That's where the bouncing ball ends, and we're going to bounce it right back up again. And the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. On your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Okay, we're going to talk about this at length here in just a moment. So I'm just trying to make you um, look at particular parts of this verse that we're really going to be looking at carefully, and that's going to be number one. We're going to look at that next. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Okay, so two things. And then he says, it shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Early Hebrew did not have pronouns like he and she, so they just put it in. And we, we know that we refer this to Christ, that uh, Christ will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Is what, what he's saying to the devil is, and don't think you're going to win this war. Don't think you're going to win this battle. I'm going to tell you at the end. I'm going to go fast forward to the very end. You're going to lose. I'm going to do three, uh, I'm first to the snake, you're going to go on your belly, but the last two were said to the devil. I'm going to, I'm not, the stuff you put into Adam and Eve, the stuff they ingested, I'm going to step in. It's not going to be able to have a free reign, do whatever you thought it was going to do, whatever you engineered it to do. It's not going to do it. I'm going to step in and there's going to be a modification. And at the end of the day, I'm going to win this, just so you know. And you won't exist anymore. Uh, that was a pretty heavy, that, that one was, uh, it was facts, but it was, it was pretty heavy. That was a pretty heavy load to unload. Okay, let's talk about Hox genes. Now, Hox genes, without giving, we could talk about Hox genes for 45 minutes. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to make some broad statements. And, and uh, as we're reading through this stuff, I think a lot of the information, too, can come across. Human beings have somewhere, oh, I think it's about 19 or 20 Hox clusters. And these clusters are very important because they determine what we look at. They determine that we have two arms. They determine that our arms are about the same length, that we have two feet, that our feet are about the same length. Have you ever wondered that, why you're, how your feet know to go to be the same length or close to it? I know there's variances. I've got a hand that's a fourth of an inch longer than the other. But generally speaking, within a ballpark, we're basically symmetrical. It also will determine that you have two eyes, that you have a head, that you have a mouth and a nose, and the head sits on your shoulders. It is the um, blueprint, if you will, for a human being, for the general skeleton human of, of the human being. It lays out what you're going to look like. And the way a fetus develops is that, you know, when the, uh, <coughs> the egg and the sperm meet, it goes through some rapid divisions, and we're going to come to a very interesting part here in a moment. It stops at eight, but then it goes on to the blastocele form. And when it gets into that area, the Hox genes start going. At this point, the, their stem cells, their, their, their non-differentiated cells, they can become anything, and then they begin to differentiate. And what calls out the differentiation is the Hox genes. The other important thing to remember is that the Hox genes are like... Um, they're directors of a symphony. They're like the director of a symphony. All of the um, members of the symphony who have musical instruments consider them protein coding areas or genes. And the conductor is up there, and he or she is directing and making music in charge of coordinating the music, at least. Every, all of those instruments could play on their own, but you wouldn't hear Beethoven's Ninth. You would hear something else cacophony. So in order for you to hear Beethoven's Ninth, there, there has to be a conductor who sits everyone down, starts them, and stops them, and does order. And he may say to the flutes, you come in now, and then he'll say over here to the uh, cello, you come in now, and he points. And every, all of these go off and on. They, 
you ne seldom see a, 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 a concert where one instrument plays the whole time. You can, but most of the time they come in and out. And that's how a baby is formed. It's like uh, when you have a, um, when you're making a um, souffle. Timing is everything. Okay, you're off a little bit on your souffle. It isn't a souffle anymore. It fails. That's the same way a fetus is. If the timing isn't perfect, if the conductors aren't in perfect order, and you might think of them as 19 different conductors, and one of them steps up, then the next one goes, because that's how the Hox genes work. One, number one starts, two, three, four, all the way down. They go in order. And so, the, and it's posteriorly dominant, when, meaning when the next guy gets up, the guy that was there before sits down automatically, there's no complaints. And he takes over, or she does, or it does. And that's how you make a baby. It's timing. And it's using the same 22,500 genes roughly to do it. You can think of the genes as piano keys on a piano, and you could also think of the Hawks genes as a piano player. It doesn't matter how you want to make your analogies. So that's why these Hawks genes are very important, or we would all look very different if we were alive at all. Hawks genes are, are central to the specifications of structures along the anterior po posterior body axis. And modifications in their expressions have paralleled the emergence of diversity in vertebrate body plans. Here we describe the genomic organization of Hox clusters in different reptiles and show that squamates, that's snakes and lizards, that, that family, have accumulated unusually large number of transposable elements at these loci in the Hox genes, in the Hox genes reflecting extensive genomic rearrangements of coding and non-coding regulatory e regions. Extensive. Let me tell you something. I'm going to show you let's see, this is the next one. No. I'm going to show you a minute, compare between a human being and a squamate, and show you the difference in the, uh, how much the Hox gene area clusters have been um, uh, infiltrated by mobile genetic elements. This atypical structure of the Hox gene clusters suggests that a strong constraint was lost within this order of animals. This is the same paper I'm quoting. This is just down further. Permitting repeats to invade loci that are otherwise resistant. In squamates, mobile genetic elements have been able to do something that they have not been able to do anywhere else in any other DNA-based organism. And that is they have invaded the Hox gene system drastically. They have completely remade what snakes look like. And I'm going to quote from people who don't believe in this record, and, not, and they'll tell you that. Um, if you look at this slide, if you see the yellow, it says cervical there, and then blue is thora thoracic dorsal, and um, I don't know if it's red. Yeah, red is lumbar, and then green is caudal. Did you see that? Those, are, um, those colors determine the areas that the numbered Hox genes, which you see there, you see a rat on, on, uh, on, my, on my right, uh, and uh, a snake on my left, a reptile. If you look at the colors, the, the numbers are, are just the numbers of the different um, Hox genes, and the ABC has to do with where it goes if it's anterior to po posterior to anterior. So these are just telling you at what part of this organism, what specific part is that, if you want to take it like a band across, is that Hox gene responsible for? And it's actually layered from posterior to anterior if the, if the uh, organism is laying down flat. So it's that well segmented. This is not just. Uh, uh, by gosh and by golly type of a system. It is very precise. It would have to be. How else could we have arms that don't, one doesn't grow a foot longer than the other? It has to be very precise. Now if you look at the snake, there are just a few cervical vertebrae. 
And then you have a whole long list line of thoracic vertebrae with verbs, with, with ribs. <coughs> there is no lumbar in the snake, and there is in the rat, as you can see. And actually, where it says the, the caudal, there is in the snake a remnant of a sacrum. And it also has what appears to be two buds on it, which um, scientists believe were the uh, buds that would have formed feet. But they don't form them. You see that? And that is solely because the hox genes have been so thoroughly invaded in the snake. But it gets worse, or better, how you want to look at it. Transposable elements are indicated with asterisks of different colors. Now, blue is for uh, DNA transposons, and we don't want to go into the difference between transposons and retrotransposons. For now, just let's look at them as mobile genetic elements. If you look at the slow worm and the corn snake down there, the boxes which has 13 on it, and then 11, and then 10, those are Cox, Hox, those are Hox genes. Hox gene clusters. Do you see all of the red and the light blue in those? Now go up to the human. Look at 13, 12, 11, and 10. You see some white areas, but the white areas do not indicate <coughs> mobile genetic elements. They indicate that there is a difference between them and, say, the, the corn snake. They're, they have different coding at that point. You don't see any color in the human, do you? I want to make sure as I look at the slide that, uh, yeah, came through that way. Look at the colors that you get down there with the squamates. They're riddled with it. In fact, most of the Hox gene has, mo made, has been nested by mobile genetic elements. A majority of his mobile genetic elements. Here, same paper. Here we describe how structural and regulatory adaptations in this gene family may have accompanied the transition towards such a body plan and suggest that the unexpected invasion of all squamata Hox clusters by transposons might have facilitated such adaptations. This is from a paper December of 2013, which would be a month ago. Well, now two months ago. And they looked at the cobra snake, and I don't want to, because time is flying, I don't want to take time to go through this slide, except to say that they validated the same thing they found in the corn snake, that with snakes in general, the reason the cobra looks the way it does is because its hox cyst, the hox gene clusters have been infiltrated and acted upon in the same way as all of the other snakes. They just happened to pick the cobra to, to, to validate that maybe the corn snake was an anomaly, and we better go and look and see if there is, in fact, this is across the line, and it is. It says the king cobra hox gene, as in other vertebrates, were found clustered at four distinct genomic loci, but the gene clusters are substantially larger than in mammals, with a 10 to 40 percent increase in size. That's, that's big. That's all mobile genetic elements. This expansion in size was mainly due to the presence of repeated elements, that's mobile genetic elements, a peculiarity that seems to be a genomic synop synopathy, synopomorphy, which means it's something that is unique to this, um, to the squamata. Of the squamata reptiles, a similar observations have been described in the corn snake and the anolis lizard and have not been reported in other vertebra taxia. So only only the reptiles, and specifically the snakes, have been hit by far the worst. Not even close. There's, no, there's, nothing, there, there's no one else in the game when you want to look at the amount with which they've had hawks um, uh, with, uh, infiltration. This type of body plan is characterized by a greatly increased number of vertebrae. This is from lizard to snake behind the evolution of an extreme body plan. A reduction of skeleton regionalization along the primary body axis and loss of limbs. Got that? Loss of limbs. 
Recent studies conducted on both mouse and snakes now hint at how changes inside the gene regulatory circuitries of the Hox genes and the somatogenesis clock. Remember clock? That's timing. That's getting the, the different genes or the protein coding areas to come together in a perfect symphony to make what you're, the organism that you're going after. Um, Recent studies have conducted on the mouse and snakes have now hint at how changes inside these gene regulatory circuitries of the Hox genes and the somatogenesis clock likely underlie these striking departures from standard tetrapod morphology, suggesting scenarios by which snakes and other elongated species may have evolved from more ordinary bodied ancestors. So they're saying that snakes weren't always this way. They had uh, a, a body habitus, in their opinion, more like the rest of the vertebrates. And interestingly, the accumulation of transposable elements within the squamata, squamate hox clusters, absent from their mammalian counterparts, notice that, may have caused the disruption of the regulatory modules. Well, and actually, here we're going to get to a case in point where we will show that they do. Axial, pa axial patterning in snakes and Sicilians, evidence of, for an alternate interpretation of the Hawks code. Now, if you notice at the very top, where you see the letter F, and then you see the chicken, and you notice uh, as you go down that black line, it bulges out, and you see a wing bud, and then it comes back in, and it keeps going down. And at the bottom, you see a hawk's B9, and it's uh, red in yours. It's purple in mine. Okay, we'll go with red. And then next to it, you see the TBX5. I call it T-Box5. It's uh, blue. This is a time. This is following time. Time is going down from top to bottom. So at the very top is the beginning of the of the of the uh, what we're watching. As this time goes on, we see a wing a wing bud form in the chicken. At the time the TB T box five gene is activated, and then when the Hox B nine turns on, when the T T box five gene stops, and we have a continued progression in the animal. Now let's look at the snake. The snake has the T box 5 gene starting at the very top, at the very beginning of this time frame. It's already running. And notice it runs the entire course of the time frame that we're looking at. Remember how things start and stop are so very important. The Hawks B9 gene starts when it's supposed to, but notice the wing bud doesn't form in the snake. Now here's the key. The snake has all the genetic information there to form a wing bud. It just doesn't do it. Snakes used to fly. Why do you think they think that reptiles were the progenitors of modern day birds? Because reptiles have the genetic code to make wings. They just don't do it because their hawks gene clusters that would allow that to happen have been infiltrated and it doesn't get turned, those hawks genes don't turn it on. Now it's even more interesting because the TB, the TBOX5 gene is important for the um, development of the heart and it's also important for the development of the arm, the upper extremity. And in humans, if you find someone that has a congenital anomaly with the hand, you immediately look at the heart because you're probably going to find an anomaly there too. It's the T-Box5 gene that's taken a hit that probably has a mutation. So, in the snake, the T-Box5 T -box gene starts way earlier than it's supposed to and it has to run the entire course of the screen. The reason is, is because the snake has a very difficult time forming a heart. And when it does form a heart, it's a three-chambered heart. It's not a four-chambered heart like we are. But it starts to form a form four-chambered heart, but it stops just before it forms the interventricular septum that is present in ours. And so it ends up with three chambers instead of four. And the reason why? Because mobile genetic elements have affected the Hox gene 
which makes that part of the heart. It's, it's now been knocked out. Why is that important? If the T-box5 gene doesn't run the entire time, the, rat, the animal has no heart and would not survive. So there's only one option for the snake. It's to run the T-box5 the whole time, but in the process of doing it, it throws off the chore choreography for the arm or for the wing bud. And the same is also true down further with the Hox genes dealing with the, co the caudal area. So the legs are knocked off the, the lower part of the snake and the wings are knocked off the upper part of the snake because it's been grossly infected with mobile genetic elements in the Hox genes themselves and is even to the point that the snake is very precarious if you look at, 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 if you, if you've, at, at, if you open up at the thoracic area up here where the snake has its heart. Um, so let me just jump ahead. I'm going to say that God was saying to the snake, in order for the snake to even survive now because of what you've ingested, we're going to have to run your T-box 5 gene continuously and you're no longer going to have wings and no longer you're going to have feet. You're going to have to slither around on the ground. You're going to have to eat dust. It wasn't God's idea. He didn't think of some clever way to really get back at the snake. This is cause and effect. Because cis regulatory mo modules may be carried around by transposing mobile elements, and because the transposition of mobile elements is the most rapid type of large scale genomic sequence change in animal genomes, this is likely to be the major me mechanism for gene regulatory networks. And it is clear that we have seen great bursts of mobile element insertion in the evolutionary history of many animal lineages, including our own. I'm going to suggest to you that this may be the main way speciation occurs. Just a thought. That's, that's another lecture. The T-box5 gene deeply embedded in the vertebrate heart formation of the gene regulatory network turns out to be regulated differently during heart formation in reptiles than in birds and mammals. And that's just what I told you. Okay, so I told you we were going to go into rather depth on uh, the snake eating um, dust. But what was the second part of that, of the um, text? It talked about, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. You and this woman will hate each other, and your descendants and hers will always be enemies. One of hers will strike you on the head, and you will strike him on the heel. This is the contemporary English version, and this is the interpretation that's widespread throughout Christendom as to what that text means. I beg to differ totally with this. The adversary does not have descendants. All of the descendants come from uh, the woman and Adam. So why isn't Adam mentioned in this? Why is just the woman mentioned? Let's go and read it again, the genomic view. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed, mobile genetic elements, the devil put in, and her seed, the original genetic material, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise its heel. Okay, this is a very, very different um, reading of the text. So let me now provide why I think that's the case. Remember, why would God just pick out Eve here? Why not pick out Adam and Eve and say, and by the way, your children, Adam and Eve, are always going to fight with, well, the devil doesn't have any children, but metaphorically speaking, the devil, the people that the devil um, is able to win into his ranks, and you guys aren't going to get along. He doesn't say that. He makes a completely, really a completely different statement. It takes a lot of interpretation to get there. And I'm not arguing that that may not be a fact in most of history, but I don't think this is the text that proves it. The word zira is what is used here in the text. And it stands for seed sowing or semen virile. It's as close as you're going to come 
in Hebrew to what we would call a genome. Now, the other words could have been used there if it was just offspring, if we're just talking posterity there, they should have used nin, or they should have used neked. There's small changes in those words, and we translate all of them seed, but in Hebrew, there are actually six, six different words that, that we would all call seed. Now, if you go to Greek, the Greek has one word, sperma, where we get the word spermatozoa. Okay, and if I think that's about as close as we're going to come in the Greek to talking genetic material. Not that they knew there was genetic material, but as close as their concept of as close as we can get to go. Mother maintains methylation marks. A DNA methyltransferase has been identified that plays a role in maintaining the methylation status of imprinted genes. Interestingly, although expressed in the unfertilized egg, this enzyme functions only during one round of replication in an eight-cell embryo. Now, I think this is fascinating, and I could, would love to spend longer. We can't. I'm going to have to just tell you some stuff real quick, and um, because the time is always my enemy, and today is no different. Uh, what happens when the cell, after they have uh, an egg impregnates a, a, a sperm impregnates an egg, is that they divide it divides four times till you get eight cells. Okay. They have eight cells there, and then everything stops. And something amazing happens in each one of those cells. The chromosomes line up like soldiers. And then the next thing that happens is the chromosomes, uh, there's all of the histones that are around them come off. They're naked. Histones are protein covering that's usually around certain parts of the genome. And then what happens is all the methylation, now the methylation, I want you to think of those as a, as a lock and a key. When something is methylated, that means it's locked down, it can't be transcribed, usually. There are some exceptions to that, yes. And let's leave those alone there, there are minor exceptions. Today we're going to talk in generalization, and generally speaking, if you're methylated, you're locked down. You cannot be read, okay, you cannot be transcribed. All of the methylation in all, on all of those chromosomes comes off. Now they're completely naked. All of the methylated areas that they inherited from mom and dad come off. And then something very interesting happens. I think my next slide does it. The mighty peewees defend the germline against genome intruders. Peewees is the name, uh, is the name given to that transfer, uh, the uh, methyltransferase that is present only in the mother's egg. And, and I'm quoting, in recent years, peewee proteins were recognized as having the potential anti-mobile element activity. And what they do is, early clues to the nature of the maternal factor came from observations that peewee proteins are essential for transposon silencing. That's what they do. They silence transposons. In the context of several mod models of hybrid dysgenesis, Moreover, both peewee and the AUB are maternally deposited and accumulate in the pole plasm, the specialized cytoplasm at the posterior end of the developing embryo that give rise to the future germline. So that's where the action is. The germline are the, the cells that are going to, uh, go, for one thing, going to form gametes in, this, um, in the new baby, whether it's going to be the uh, you know, ova or sperm and things of that nature. What, how, what do these peewee proteins do? Well, they have an extremely important job. Small RNAs present in the maternal germ cells, notice maternal, I'm going to point that out, are also faithfully transmitted to progeny. However, since the sperm discards most of its cytoplasm post-meatotically, similar species are likely not paternally inherited. The sperm is only a protein coat around the male genome and a few messenger RNA and microRNAs that come along. That's it. There isn't room for this large protein or the AUB protein, which augments it. Okay? You don't have room in the sperm head to do it. Okay, what do these proteins do? Well, under the direction, well, I better read this and then I'll tell you what they do because I want to get one thing in here. This gives rise to clear differences in the embryonic content of peewee interacting RNAs. D 
depending upon whether an element was maternally or paternally inherited. And these differences correlated perfectly with the ability of progeny to silence the dysgenesis-inducing transposon. That, uh, these studies demonstrated that differences in the inheritance of material small RNA populations underline hybrid dysgenesis. They also highlighted the, highlighted the broader conclusion that maternally inherited small RNAs are required to prime resistance pathways at each generation in order to effectively silence at least some of the mobile genetic elements. And the presence of the sequences within a the PWE um, interacting RNA cluster corresponding to a particular element may not alone be sufficient to achieve effective silence in the absence of maternal small RNAs. Now, there's a big mouthful there. Let me just cut it down. What happens is this protein that sits in the mother's ovum is a big protein and it, trans and it methylates down the uh, mobile genetic elements. What happens is there's, a, there's three enzymes that start at the beginning of each one of these chromosomes and start going down. They do a, the 3.2 billion base pairs in blinding speed. They go down and they remethylate at certain parts only transposable elements and they do it. It's almost identical across humanity. It's as if God cleans the slate and says, I'm going to take a portion of the mobile genetic elements and we're taking them out of play. Everyone gets to start the same. So if you're getting a lot of methylation from mom or dad, that goes. And the other important thing here that you got to re remember is that when the, um, when the methylation uh, occurs, no one knows how these enzymes know exactly where to put it. If they don't do it, let's say we go in there and we stop this from happening. There is no fetus. There is no embryo. The thing shuts down and dies immediately, within hours. If the mobile genetic elements aren't silenced that are programmed by the peewee protein and the microRNA from the mother, there will be no baby, period. So this isn't just a cosmetic thing. This is period. Now, you remember Molly, the cloned sheep? You know why Molly died? She, she, when she was cloned, she was already well advanced in age and she died there. It's because Molly was taken from a somatic cell which had methylation in areas which occur with aging that we talked about last week. Important areas get methylated down in the body's attempt to stop the mobile genetic elements. They start methylating around them and they methylate on important genes and that's what causes us to age. Remember that? That's why she didn't make it. If, they, if, if, if the researchers had a way to go in there, take the somatic cell, strip it down like I just told you, activate the peewee system, and go ahead and remethylate her just with a starting methylation, she would have lived a normal life. Spam. This is only in the mother. It's not in the dad. And if the mother doesn't have this, there is no progeny. So you've got to thank your mother. Mother's Day is coming up in a while. You better thank your mother for, if, if for no other reason, she gave you a chance to survive. She carried the information that was necessary to stop the mobile genetic elements, which would have certainly precluded your birth. And now, I know we took some time on the serpent, but I had to show you there was a, there was a lot of genetic information on this, and I can guarantee you I left more on the cutting floor than I presented to you today. And to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your, des your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And, and as I said earlier, what we meant was, you know, Eve, when you have a baby, you're going to wish you hadn't done this. And to the woman he said, this is the NIV, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Pregnancy and birth. Transposon-mediated rewiring of gene regulatory networks contributed to the evolution of pregnancy in mammals. 
We explored the gene regulatory landscape of mammalian endometrial cells using comparative RNA SEQ and found that 1,532 genes were recruited into the endometrial expression in placental mammals, indicating that the evolution of pregnancy was associated with a large scale rewiring of the gene regulatory network. About 13% of recruited genes are within 20 kilobytes of a Eutherian specific transposable element MER20. These transposons have the epigenetic signatures of enhancers, insulators, and repressors directly bind transcription factors essential for pregnancy and, coordinate, and coordinately regulate gene expression in response to progesterone and cyclic AMP. We conclude that the transposable element MIR20 contributed to the origin of a novel gene regulatory network. This is a whole regulatory network dedicated to pregnancy in placental mammals, particularly by recruiting the cyclic AMP signaling pathway into the endometrial stromal cells. There's all kinds of information here. You know what this tells you? I will fill in some of the blanks here. Because of mobile genetic elements, women have a progesterone G-coupled protein inserted into their endometrial stromal cells, which make them available for, a, for menstruation. Without that, you won't get menstruation. They have coded in menstruation. This was mobile, genelic, mobile genetically coded for. No one argues with that. So at a time in the past, before the mobile genetic elements came in, women didn't go through menstrual cycle. But it even gets, we've just started. There is a broad consensus that many of the genetic changes underlying the evolution of, morpho of morphology occur by the stepwise modification of individual pre-existing cis regulatory element modules. However, it is questionable whether the origin of complex novelties, such as the origin of a new cell type, do you get that? New cell type. This author is going to tell you that mobile genetic elements have, have gotten gene regulatory networks which have produced a new cell type which involves the recruitment of hundreds of genes can be achieved by these small scale changes, what he's referring to mutations. And he's talking about how can we do it then. Our findings indicate that the gene regulatory network was rewired in placental mammals during the evolution of pregnancy, a reorganization partly mediated by the transposable element MIR-20. And there's other transposable elements who have been implicated that do the rest of it. These findings strongly support the existence of transpon me transposon mediated gene regulatory innovation at the network level. What does this tell you? Well, it tells you without mobile genetic elements, there wouldn't be a placenta, there wouldn't be a syncytial trophoblast. Those are entirely coded for by pseudogenes, which are brought in by mobile genetic elements. And I didn't put up the papers where, the, uh, where uh, the, the scientists who've been looking at that say, well, maybe humans used to be like the kangaroos, marsupials. Live birth, they say, is something that came along sort of late in the evolutionary pathway, and it was due to mobile genetic elements. Now, that should ring a bell when Christ, God said, you're going to now have pain in childbirth, or you're going to have pain when you bring forth children. The human placenta, unique in its active expression of retroviral sequences that are not expressed in other tissues, and that's important, we're going to come to this in a second, this is very important. They have some special retroviral mobile genetic elements that you aren't going to find anywhere else in the body. They only show up in the placenta. May hold the key to an improved understanding of the functional significance of human endogenous retroviruses. That's another name for mobile genetic elements. In this review, we discussed the kind of contribution of retro elements, particularly HERVs, to the placental function and dysfunction. And as you might guess, why, do, why we get eclampsia and preeclampsia. If you think mobile genetic elements, you would be right. 
retroviruses and the placenta. The close apposition of the uterine and placental tissues creates a site for viral transmission from mother to fetus. By this path, a heterozygous endo, um, endogenous retrovirus in the mother could potentially colonize all of a mother's offspring, not just the 50% that are inherited by Mendelian means. For this to be an effective route of ongoing contagion, Viruses transmitted from mother to placenta must sometimes reinfect somatic or germ cells of the fetus or mother before the placenta is discarded at delivery. What, are, what is it saying here? What they're saying is this. If you could find a way to get a human fertilized egg into a, a woman's uterus, and you were able to an engineer so that that early zygote had no mobile genetic elements. It would be absolutely impossible for that baby to go to gestation and be born without being riddled with them. So just let's think out loud for a minute. Who do you think would have a vested interest if they knew that the remedy for the human race was going to come through a human mother who would have a vested interest to change the way women have children? To make 100% certain that all the progeny, every human baby that is born of a human mother would be infected with mobile genetic elements. There is no option because the syncytiotrophoblast, which covers the, the fetus and keeps the fetus from being rejected from the mother because of the HLA. Oh, by the way, HLA is probably, those antigens are probably mobile genetic elements driven pseudogenes that were brought in. The evidence isn't fully out yet, but the, uh, when you look at the, what they have found, that the, so far most all the HLA that they've looked at have come in from pseudogenes. So the mother would reject that baby without the syncytial trophoblast. And the syncytial trophoblast can only be produced by mobile genetic elements, and it, the syncytial trophoblast, is a wild exporter of mobile genetic elements. It puts it into the amniotic fluid so that baby will be bathed in them and every part of that baby will be exposed to them at all levels of its development or her, its, yeah, its development. Birth equals infection. It's a common pathway you would almost think someone engineered it, thinking, well, I'm going to change the way women have babies, and that way, if anything comes through this, they're going to be under my control. Or at least I'll get all of my mobile genetic elements into them. I don't know if the Catholic, knew, Catholic uh, Church knew this when they, in the 1850s or 1880s, said that... Uh, Mary was, was without original sin. I don't know if they already had uh, pre-knowledge uh, pre of this. I don't know, but that's one way to get around it. But then, of course, then you're going to have that problem with Mary and her mother. So you've just kicked the can down the road a little ways. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. NIV, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. I have no problem with that statement at all. Other things that are interesting, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, is just to say that the ability to form a syncytium, which means it's a, a cell which, uh, the, the cell uh, barriers between a number of cells melt away and the cells become one long cell with multiple nuclei. Muscle cells are a good example of this. Cells in the cornea are another good example of this. And then, of course, the syncytial trophoblast, which is what is the sac that the uh, baby resides in, is the classical example of this. Um, without this, this, this ability to form syncytium is, uh, is found elsewhere. And some um, of the geneticists say, well, here's proof that mobile genetic elements really do provide a function to the body because we wouldn't have muscle cells like we do today. Well, my answer to that is, how do you know that uh, the muscle cells with the syncytium are actually better than what possibly was originally there before? And we know it doesn't help your cornea. Yes, it, they, some people say, well, it enables light to go through. 
but we don't know what the predecessor was, but we do know this, that it also makes the corneal cells very pliable, and they tend to change shape, and when they change shape, you need glasses. Pain receptors are all G-coupled proteins, and they were all modified by mobile genetic elements. Now we, we're on the homeward stretch now. We're almost done. Now we, we, we have to talk to Adam. And, and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying you should not eat it, cursed is the ground for your sake, and sorrow shall you eat, it, eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you, you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now, if you were here last week, I don't need to talk about death, the first death. We clearly showed mobile genetic elements are entirely 100%, no questions asked, uh, um, responsible for the first death if you eliminate things like infectious agents, which are also mobile genetic element driven, or trauma. If you take those two out of the way, you just leave an organism there to live out their normal lifespan. The reason they die is because of the programming of mobile genetic elements. So we've already covered that one. We're not going to cover it again. If you want to go over that, go look over a lecture. It's labeled Lecture 3. So uh, now thorns and thistles. This is the only one that uh, Dr. Mike Webster and I have looked at extensively. And no one has done the research to verify what we think is going on. And what we think is going on is if you look at in plants where it comes to the area where it talks about, well, what talks about, where it codes for leaf formation, there are a bunch of uh, mobile genetic elements which are sitting right next to it, but we don't know if they're going to cause this, but I will tell you how you get a thorn versus a leaf. All it does is it change if you, if you get a, a leaf, uh, what happens is it goes clockwise as it opens up. If you get a thorn, it turns the opposite way as a, as a leaf is going out, and it forms a sharp pointed object. See that? So it, all, it determines whether you go clockwise or counterclockwise. Now, that's a simple thing for mobile genetic elements to do. I mean, if they can recruit whole regulatory networks, if they have obviously done something major to the way ba women have children, we don't know what, how they had before this incident, but we do know they have really changed the landscape. No one can argue that. I have mercifully saved you about 20 articles where we could have just nailed every inch of this down. There's no room for escape on this one, none. So to actually just change the direction as the leaf comes out is a minor thing, but no one's done it. Now, people have tried to take roses, and they say that they have um, uh, bred the roses so that the thorns disappear. But the trouble is, when you stress the roses that they have, they'll sell you the seed, guess what happens? The thorns reappear. What this tells you is happening, and they've shown this to happen, is that you have an epigenetic phenomenon in this breeding process, you get something called microRNAs, which actually change the way the protein coding areas uh, not can be transcribed, but more importantly, they edit the transcription once it comes off. And they edit out the ability of the plant to make the thorn. But what happens with these microRNAs when you get under a stressful f conditions, uh, as happens in plants and in mammals and anything that's got DNA, you stress it, what happens is, is the methylation in the cell breaks down because the cell can't take care of whatever inf invading, whether it's a virus or lack of water or whatever it is that's coming from the outside, it can't take care of that and keep the constant job of keeping these retro elements methyled, methylated down and they let, they let go on the methylation. And when, when they let go of the methylation, you get all kinds of new mobile genetic elements that come in to play that have been kept silent prior to this stress. And so what happens in this rose is when you stress it, the mobile genetic elements which were silenced by the microRNA, which were bred back and forth, no longer function. And the, 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 um, the thorns reappear. So it's not actually changing the code. It was just changing the microRNA, which is epigenetic. And I know I spit a lot of that out quickly. 
uh, that's for those of you who are somewhat sophisticated with genetics, you can follow it. For the rest of you, it's just a uh, epigenetic phenomenon that we're dealing with in those roses. It's not an actual change to the um, letters of the DNA itself. So I, don't, I can't talk about that one. The more the better. The role of polyploidy in facilitating plant invasion. It's clearly understood now that where weeds came from, well, they came from normal growing grasses, but something happened. They were absolutely inundated with long terminal repeats, which is a special type of mobile genetic element which tends to um, hit only plants. Plants, the, their biggest mobile genetic element are long terminal repeats. We do have long terminal repeats, but nothing like plants do. And what happens with them is that we have uh, shown that polyploidy, that means more than one set of chromosomes. I mean, we're not talking about a little bit of genetic information. We're talking about a whole, a whole the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, that polyploidy might be an important factor in species invasion success and suggest that polyploidy, that ploidy, must be considered in any general model that seeks to explain why some species are more successful than others as invaders. And here's a list, and without going at I just want you to look down. It says, um, notice there on New Zealand under the induced range. This gives you the uh, mobile genetic elements <coughs> which um, have caused, and if you notice under New Zealand, the 4X, 5X, and 6X, that means they have four times the normal amount of chromosomes, five times the normal uh, number of chromosomes, or six times the amount of normal chromosomes. What happens when these occur is the plants become like weeds. They are rapacious in the way that they go, and they will dig in, and they will start growing immediately, and they will compete very successfully against any other plants that are going around it. It's this change that tains, takes a regular grass and changes it into a weed in its behavior. And it, this, as you might guess, is mobile genetically uh, d driven. You, you, by now, you probably are guessing nothing. Everything I'm going to put up here is tied to that in some way or another. First death was already discussed in lecture three. And I'm just going to put this up here because I know that this is, some of you, this is uh, an Adventist audience, have, are well acquainted with this statement. It says, there was nothing poisonous in the fruit of the tree of knowledge itself. Nothing that would cause death and partaking of it. The tree had been placed in the garden to test their loyalty to God. Well, I'm in the process of making a whole lecture on this because, um, well, if we just look at it the way it's written, it says that would cause death. Well, all I've been talking about with mobile genetic elements is death. So how could I make that statement in the face of this? She makes three other statements where she said poisonous and things of that way. Well, mobile genetic elements are not poisonous. They're made out of messenger RNA or DNA and your whole, it's part of our, as we say, it's part of our DNA, it's part of our framework, so that's not poisonous. I picked this one on purpose because it appears to be the most contradictory. I will just give you a couple of one-line statements right now. It actually, as you can see, has got a lot of fascinating genetic evidence behind it. I will just say this, <clears throat> when the devil, I'm now going to assume that my paradigm is correct because I'm going to talk in, the, in, the, in that um, genre. When the devil came to infect Adam and Eve, his idea was not to kill them. His idea was to change them so that they would become his cohorts in crime and that they would eat of the tree of life and live forever and they would therefore become his base. He, would be, he was recruiting his army. He had angels. He was now going to have human beings and the idea was slowly but surely to go through guerrilla warfare throughout the universe picking off all of God's created beings, and pretty soon God would be left alone in the middle, and everyone would say, well, the gig's up now. We're taking over. And the idea, you know, I don't know if he thought God was loving and would, wouldn't have all of his creation wiped out. I don't know what the thought was at that process, but it was clear, if, you know, if you're going to quote Ellen White, then I can quote Ellen White, and I've got a lot of quotes from her, and where she says, well, that the seeds of death were planted, planted in the human system when Adam ate of the tree of life. I mean, a tree of knowledge of good and evil. So we have some what appears to be ambiguous statements then, both on both sides of the fence. And actually, they both are true when you, when you go back in a forensic way and you line it up. 
and it has to do with HIV and why some people don't get it today and others do. It has to do with all kinds of very interesting scientific evidence that we now know. And in, in a way, it gives us a full blueprint of what the, I feel of how the devil was able to accomplish it and how he started out. But the long and the short of it was the devil didn't want them to die either. So their first inoculum did just three or four things to them. And one of them was to make make it so that he could uh, introduce retro elements at will, because that's where he's going to really make his job. The first invaders were probably transposases, which were DNA, and, and they do a cut and paste, whereas retro transposons do a copy paste. And a copy paste allows you to spread everywhere. So the bottom line is, this is not, in my opinion, at all contradictory to what I've told you. In fact, I would use it as a validating quote from her when you put the others in because she makes it clear that what caused death was not being, uh, not having a, uh, being able to eat of the tree of life. That's what caused the death. Was not, we're looking in the wrong place. The cause of death was not eating of the tree of life. And you also notice that there was never a time when the tree of life was on earth I mean, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was on earth, that the tree of life wasn't right next to it. And God already said, if you ate of the tree of life, you would live forever, right? So you could eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and you could also eat of the tree of life, and you wouldn't die. So there was nothing in the fruit, technically, that would cause death. It was the being kept from eating the tree of life that caused the death. Mobile genetic elements speed it up. There's no doubt about that, and I, we can show you this. But at the end of the day, the perfect antidote was the tree of life. I've given you just a small brief overview. If you get into the genetics, it's way more fascinating and it, it casts a lot of light onto how we're trying to fight certain re retro elements today in the form of uh, viruses. So I'm, uh, when I get that lecture ready, we'll let you know. Anyway, I'm mercifully done.